As we gather on this rainy, rainy Sunday and uh, have a fall break and all the transition of folks all over the place and all the things that are going on, we rejoice today and that we get to talk about Jesus. I hope you are thankful for the opportunity for us to gather together and realize um, that most of the world, a lot of the world does not have this privilege for us to just gather on a Sunday together and worship in his name. It's a wonderful thing. So every single Sunday, be thankful for that as we continue our study. I'm going to ask you if you would to turn to Matthew chapter 6 as we continue looking at the disciples prayer. Just a reminder of why it's the disciples prayer is because it cannot be the Lord's prayer in the sense that Jesus would not pray some of these things. He wouldn't need to. It would be unnecessary. And he had given this prayer and he had told his disciples, when you pray, pray like this. And so we've been walking through what I've been calling the broad brush strokes of ideas or thinking when it comes to prayer and how we are to pray and connect with God. You know, the one thing that God wants us to do is be in relationship with Him. And relationship with Him is more than a religious experience. It is more than a single moment of decision. It is an ongoing trust and walk with the Lord that makes your life different, makes the things that you do different in the way you live. Now couple of things to talk about this as we read it. Uh, I want you to remember that the first thing we said is this is not words that we're talking about, but a posture or a position of your heart. Prayer is not words in the sense that the words have to be correct, but it is a position of the heart. And the words that we have said and the words that we've been talking about have to do with that position. And so as we look at each of these pieces, and we kind of catch us up to where we are. If you haven't been here on Sundays, uh, this might be all new to you, so jot it down. If you have been, it should be kind of a refresher for you. But the first part of this, if we talk about what prayer it is, being able to acknowledge that God is God to us. That he is greater than us and bigger than us, yet he is still loving. When we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, that's what we're saying. That we are saying, God, we will let you be God to us. And that that relationship will be loving because of who you are. And then we talked about what it means to have his kingdom come and his will be done in our life. And of course, what I want you to see about that, and if there's a statement that sums that up, it's to say this. We seek to think God's thoughts about our situation and to live his will in our reaction to our life. So we seek to think God's thoughts about our situation and live out his will in our reaction to our life. This is what God calls us to do in this relationship. And so now as we go through that process, we get to this next uh, phrase, which is give us this day our daily bread. So let's read this all together and we'll, we'll start at verse 9. Let's read the whole prayer and then we'll talk about this new phrase. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Give us this day our daily bread. There's words here I want to pull out and talk about the position of our heart and our understanding in these. And the first word I want us to talk about, the first thing I want you to notice there is give us this day our daily bread. I happen to be a man that won't pass on a biscuit. That's just the honest truth. Uh, you know, if you offer me one, I'm going to take it. It's about every time. If there's honey around or molasses, I'm going to jump on that too. Uh, I really do believe biscuits and gravy are the best thing ever invented. I'm going to mess your brain, mind up for a second, but I want you to think about it. If you look at the ingredients of gravy and then you look at the ingredients of biscuits, really what you have is you have liquid biscuit poured on a biscuit. Let that blow your mind for a second. Greatest food ever invented. But I don't want you to miss what Jesus is saying when he says bread. You see, the first thing we need to see in this phrase, give us our daily bread, is that bread in that culture 
in that world, in that situation, was a staple. It was survival food. It was the thing that you ate in order to make it. You might catch something and get some protein. You might be able to grow some some, uh, vegetables or fruits if the time was right and the season went well. But when it came down to it, if you had to hold something down, it was going to be grain that was going to make it through. So what Jesus wants us to see in our prayer life is the number one thing we are doing is looking for a staple, a foundation in God's provision in our life, an anchor that holds us together. Now, I want you to think for a second, okay? Because it was bread in that culture, most of the time unleavened bread, uh, in other cultures, to use this same foundation, if he was talking to the Asian world, he might say, uh, give us this day our daily bowl of rice. If he was in Ireland, he might say, give us this day our potato. If he was in the Latin world, he may say, give us this day our tortillas. Or, for those of us who are southern, give us this day our biscuits and gravy. Right? It's a staple. It's a foundation. And it's not a coincidence that this is the term he uses there. He does not say, give us our steak. You know, when we splurge, now I will confess this, Kim and I going out for an anniversary dinner, we don't go get biscuits and gravy. We say, let's go get a big steak. We splurge. It's not the splurge that we look for in our relationship with God here. It's the staple. And so we see this parallel to bread, and I want you to make sense of this. This parallel to bread in Scripture is a very important thing for you to understand why he chooses this. This is the same piece of food that he uses when he talks about himself. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the staple. I'm the thing that will hold you together. I'm the thing you're going to need the most. I'm going to be the thing that will hold together a meal and keep you sustained in life. I'm the bread of life. You even see this exchange. I want you to hold your place right there and I want you to flip over chapter 4. An interesting moment when Jesus is tempted. Matthew gives us this record of his 40 days in the wilderness. And of course it tells us in in Matthew chapter 4 that he was hungry. And because he was hungry and he was hungry in this moment, uh, Satan in his tempting of him says, Hey, listen, I will turn this stone into bread. Look at the response that's given in verse 4. Here's what Jesus answered. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's a passage from Deuteronomy that Jesus quotes to Satan, and I want you to listen to it and make sense of a couple of things. Man shall not live by bread alone, Alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Make a connection there. It would be seen more faithful for us to say, we don't need to eat. If you've got Jesus in your life, you don't need to eat. That sounds very powerful and very faithful. There are people who have taken their bad theology like that and they have pushed themselves so far into that. And you have heard stories about these. These things come up occasionally on the news where they may say to themselves, you know what, I don't need medicine if I've got faith. I don't need to go to the hospital if I've got faith. We come in an area where there are some churches and they're still around, believe it or not, where they like to take uh, poison and drink it in their service. Where they like to hold snakes in their hand and sing hymns. Now we are going to make Chris do that. Chris, you up for that? Rattlesnake? What are they saying? It's a ridiculous idea an extreme that Jesus doesn't want you to understand that you don't need physical provision. 
So when Jesus responds to Satan, listen to what he says. Man shall not live by bread alone. You do need bread to live. But he gives us this second phrase, and this is what helps us to make sense of this prayer. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, the power in our prayer when we pray and ask God to give us this staple of daily bread, what we are doing in that moment when we pray like that is we are saying to God that if I were to live, it would be because of you and what you provided for me. And if I were to die in the flesh, I would live on because of who you are and what you've done. Now, up until this point in the prayer, and if you'll flip back over there, I want you to look. We've been talking about God and his relationship to us, who God is and how we position ourselves to him. This is really the first time that something starts to come back to us and benefit in this prayer. The first part is, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's setting a position, an understanding, a relationship that we have to God, how we relate to God. Then you see this change, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's a change in the position and the way we enter act with the world so we start saying you know what I don't look at the world the same way that everybody else does because God is my father and he is God to me I see the world differently so his kingdom is more valuable than the things the world says is valuable and then there's a change that says although there are ways that I want to live your will will be done in the way I live just like it is in heaven and then we see the shift where we get to ask God To provide for us. And his provision for us is bread. The staple. The thing that holds it together. The thing you need more than anything else. There might be other things, but there's something that keeps you alive. And so that's the way our relationship with him connects. So if he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. I want you to stop again and I want you to notice the second thing here. There's an absolute assumption. There's not a word with this, but there's an absolute assumption that oftentimes we will miss. In this prayer and in this posture, Who provides for us the things we need? God does. It's God, God's the one who provides for us. God is the one who provided what you have and what you have done. God's the one who provides for us uh, where we are and the jobs we have and the gifts we have and the things we've been blessed with and the things that are going on. It's God that provides those things for us. See, there is a mentality here that you have to understand in your prayer life, something you have to understand to be able to make sense of. And here's what it is, is that God is the one who provided for you anything and everything that you have. You ever heard the phrase, uh, you know, I got to go out and make some dough? It's not a coincidence. I want you to think about that. It's connected to this staple. I got to make, make some dough. I got to go out and make some dough. Why? Because I need some bread. Now, what can happen in your life is you can give yourself credit to think that the things you have had something to do with what you've done. I want to tell you if you want to mess up your giving and if you want to see what generosity uh, doesn't look like, when you start to give to the mission of God and the kingdom of God and you think that you're giving him your money. You see, when you are giving in response to God's compulsion... When you are giving to God as if you have something and God wants something and God says to you, give it to me or I'll do bad things to you and you start to give to God to appease him, well, that's more of a tribal God of some kind. It's more of a life in a village somewhere or some kind of real pagan perspective or works perspective of your relationship to God. See, Christians never give like that. See, Christians give something that doesn't belong to them. And it's a lot easier to give like that. 
You know what I'd love to do? I Sometimes I get the opportunity to go to uh, charitable uh, you know, dinners, fundraisers, and you go there. And, and you know that at the end, they're going to show you what they're doing, and the mission they're doing, the things that are happening. And you know at the end, they're going to ask you to donate and give. I think it would be an incredible thing to do is to have everyone, right before you do that, say, now, before we talk about giving, I want you to take your wallet, and I want you to sit it out on the table in front of you. And then I want, to ta- I want you to take your wallet, and I want you to hand it to the person on the left here at the table. And they're going to give how they always wanted to give. With your money. Now as crazy as that sounds, is it easier to give something that doesn't belong to you? Well, of course it is. You know, I have spent time in ministry. I've been in ministry, you know, I don't know, 20 years now. And I'll be honest with you, uh, there is one of the most dangerous things that can ever happen in ministry. It scares me to death every time is some, when someone donates something to the church. Because I always get afraid that they think they still own it. You ever seen that moment? We donated those chairs. We donated that table. We donated that sign. But they still own it. I I will tell you that as a pastor, I've stood up in pulpits and said, hey, listen, if things, you feel like things still belong to you, take them home. Because we gotta we gotta have this stuff be the God stuff and we gotta figure out where we actually stand with what we have. But do you see that's a flaw in understanding what you have, not what you gave. It's a misunderstanding of provision, God's provision in your life. So when Jesus tells his disciples to say to God, give us this day our daily bread. He is saying, remember that all your gifts, your blessings, your labor, your work, your everything was his in the first place. And so he is the one that provides what you receive. And he is saying the things that you receive are the staples of life in God. The things that hold you together. Now, let, let's keep looking because there, there's, there's another, there's an incredible word in here. And I'm going to tell you a little history about this word so you can understand this. Verse 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. I want you to see that word daily. Now, uh, epiogios is the Greek word for that. Now, I've been practicing that all morning in my office to say that. I think I did all right. You all wouldn't know the difference, would you? Neither would I. Well, let me tell you about that word a little bit. This is it. For years in Greek, nobody knew what that word meant. It's not found in any other ancient Greek literature. It's not found anywhere else in the Bible. And so what had to happen is those folks who did research and study, the scholars who were studying the linguistics of the, of the Greek language and be able to make sense of this, had to take it apart and understand the pieces in order to make sense of it. And their guess was, it means enough for the day. Now what's interesting is, now we know that it means enough for the day. Let me tell you why. Haddon Robinson records that it was about, I, I think, uh, you know, several years ago, uh, they found in ancient Middle Eastern uh, artifacts, they found on a little strip of papyrus a lady's grocery list. And it had all the things she was going to pick up today, that, that day at the market. And it would say bread, epiogios, butter, epiogios. Oil, epiogios, enough for the day. You see, one of the most dangerous things you can do in your prayer life is try to build it up. Pray real hard when things are tough, walk away and don't talk to God anymore. Have God be part of your life, but he's just somebody you check in with when things are tough. 
I've got friends like that from high school that I don't talk to very often. We pick up every once in a while. When we pick up, man, we're just right where we were. But I wouldn't say they're as close as I am to my wife or even a lot of you all that I see several times through the week. See, there's a reason that he wants us to pray for God's provision daily. Enough for the day. One is because it reminds us who provides it. If every single day you put the posture of your heart that the things that you have came from God, therefore still belong to God, you will live a different kind of life in the things you do. So he wants us to understand that God is giving enough for the day because God is the one who's providing daily. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling daily. Now, it also, this word daily, tells us something else, that there is a moment when you are blessed that you should assume it is not just for you. And this is the other word. I'm going to connect these two together. I want you to see this. Look at what he says here. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us. So a Christian doesn't get two loaves of bread and assume that one of them is for them to eat and one of them for them to eat later. But they think in a family perspective that God's people are all being provided for. That I'm part of something bigger than just my family. But I'm part of the kingdom of God and the people of God and I'm walking with God. How often do you look at excess as opportunity to provide for someone else? And how often do you look at excess that's been given to you as opportunity for you to store up for yourself later? You see, there's something powerful about these words and the way our heart is supposed to see God. God as the provider. God as the one who provides the staple that makes our life work, the thing that holds our life together. He's going to give it to us daily because he's engaged in a relationship with us. And he's given us just enough for ourselves. And if he gives more than that, understand that this prayer is not give me my daily bread, but give us our daily bread. You see, in this sentence, although it is talking about us getting our needs met, it is everything we need to learn about what it means to be generous in the way we live our life and what we do. It's a statement to say, God is the one who gives. He will be the one that provides. And what he gives me will be enough. And if I see it as more, I get to be part of answering this prayer too. Incredible, incredible picture. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. When you see the things you own, do you see God as the provider? When you go out and earn do you see God as the one who sustained you and made it possible for you to do that? And when you have the, uh, the fortunate opportunity to have more than you need, did you see your part in fulfilling this prayer for somebody else? What Jesus does is he gives us a picture of who he is and what he has done. See, Jesus is the bread of life, and those who eat that bread are hungry no more. So everything that we get points to Jesus. You bless, you're blessed with something new. 
the fact that you have it shouldn't point to what you have done, but to what Jesus has done. Now, here's what's incredible about this. Some of you have lost things. Some of you have been hurt. You've been cheated in business. You have had the market crash when you had to buy or sell something. You have been cheated and overpaid for something. You have not had enough. You've made bad decisions. You've made tough situations happen in your life. I'm going to tell you something. You want to know how God wants you to cope with that? Is to go back to him and say, give us our daily bread. When God did something with what you have been given and you lost it, and it never belonged to you, it's easier to take. When what you have has been called and convicted by Jesus for you to give it away, it's easier to do when it never belonged to you in the first place. And there's something wonderful about connecting with God's people when you get to be the one that meets the need for somebody else. Now I'm going to tell you about being in ministry. I am a product of a guy named Charlie and a lady named Ruth, Charlie and Ruth Cole. In 1999, I was uh, really interested in going on a mission trip. And I had no idea this mission trip would be this life-changing moment for me. I went, I spent 12 weeks in the Philippines uh, doing mission work at, at a Joy Student Center is what it was called. It was a uh, uh, next to a bunch of colleges and I would go there and I'd play chess and ping pong and share the gospel with students that were on their break. I was able to go because Charlie and Ruth heard that I was really interested and they paid my way. They didn't have to do that. When I went there, two things happened. One, God really solidified my call to ministry in whatever way he saw fit. I was going to do it. The second thing is I realized I could not be that far away from that woman that sits right over here. So two things I learned. Both of those have to do with who I am and what I've been called to do. But from this point forward, I'm going to tell you something. Charlie and Ruth are tied to every person God allows me to influence in ministry. There's not one moment that I don't teach a sermon and if God uses it, if he so uses it to impact somebody's life, it has to do with the fact that they gave and met a need. And see, here's what's incredible. I already know that there are a lot of you all who already have stories like that. I've seen a lot of generosity behind the scenes here at First Baptist Alco. I really have. Seeing people, sending people to camp, sending them on trips, meeting needs for things that we have expense-wise, sacrificially giving, because they understand this principle of us. See, the thing is, give us this day our daily bread. It says, God is my provider. I'm part of a family, and we help each other meet our needs. And God's going to give it to us daily when we need it. And when we get it, it'll be the thing that holds our life together. Give us this day our daily bread. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it. Thank you, God, that we get to have a relationship with you. It is an incredible truth and a great honor to know that you have done so much for us through your son. And Father, we say at First Baptist Alcoa that there is not one person who comes to know you. There's not one bill that gets paid, one circumstance that we go through that we do not rejoice and say that you are the one who did that. And God, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are the provider for your churches and for their mission and for your people. I pray, God, that we would be people who look for you 
to sustain us. Father, in a, uh, in a gathering like this, there are people who right now, they're a little worried about the bread. They're not quite sure where that's going to come from. And it's hard in their faith to see how you're going to make ends meet and make things happen. God, may this prayer ring from their heart. And may you answer it because we know you will. Lord, we thank you for the great bread of life. We thank you that we gather because we have eaten of that bread and we, we will hunger no more. Let Jesus be the center of what we do as we respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen.